Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Latif, and welcome to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast. This is episode 30. You heard right. Number three zero. <laughs> okay? So we've been doing this every day for the last 30 days, and I am excited. I'm, I'm really happy about it. So, but anyway, uh, have, uh, next week is going to start. We have a few extra things coming in. We have a few other shows we're going to be talking about next week. Um, some of the stuff I already touched on, so I won't repeat myself. But uh, other than that, uh, it's, a, it's a good night. I feel good. I've been pretty busy all day today. And uh, a lot of stuff on my mind, a lot of things I'd like to talk to you guys about. And uh, a couple things real quick. Um, so as you know, we, also, we have this podcast on pretty much all of the podcast apps. If there are any that are missing, please do me a favor and mention it in whatever comment section yeah whatever platform you're listening to this leave in the comments i think the only two comment areas will be um would be youtube and facebook okay so in the comments section underneath this particular um podcast as um let me know which if there are any platforms that you can't find us so that way I can go after those um, I really I'm trying to go wide I'm not trying to um, get all the listeners on one area my m- the the objective here is to get people to to hear my message and to connect with me because I have a lot of information you got to think about it like this if I'm planning on doing this every day then I, it's because I have a lot of information to share. Right now, I'm working on my communication skills with you as a podcast. You got to realize my environment here. I'm basically talking. I'm talking to you, but there's no one here, and there's no camera, and I have no one to beside me asking questions. So there's no dialogue. There's no going back and forth. So this is also an exercise for me in hopes that I can perfect this so I can share with you guys some really great information that I have. Um, And it's just going to take a little time. And, you know, with the commitment that I made for this podcast, eventually I'm going to get through it. But it's not going to do me much good. It's not going to really benefit me unless you guys are responding to it and and it's helping you guys in any way whatsoever. And if there's something that maybe I can help you with, um, please let me know. Understand that I've been doing this for pretty much my entire life, okay? I'm 53 years old. I started working with little Susie when she was five years old. She's 40 years old right now, okay? And just to to make sure this is all clarified, it's January 30th, 2020. She is 40 years old. So I've been doing this quite a while. I've had my hands in many different areas from wanting to be an artist, from from basically performing on a stage as a rapper, to producing, to writing, to road managing, to distribution. I've even printed vinyl. I've been a part of the manufacturing process. I've done graphics. I've done marketing. I've done retail sales and marketing. Uh, It goes on. It goes on. so um, I, I have I ran my own label. You know, it doesn't matter how big or how small it was. You know, a lot of times if you're working with a big label, uh, there's a lot of people involved that are doing a lot of things. When it's your own label and it's small, you actually learn a hell of a lot more than the average person. So you're, you're hands on. You're doing everything from finding the, 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 the material to having it produced 
to having it, you know, just a production process from going from a, from production to mix down to mastering and then, you know, you know, getting a, a you know, get, getting it pressed up, whatever format, whether you're doing CDs or vinyl, whatever the case may be, the packaging, the labels, everything that's a part of setting up the barcode. You know, nowadays you can go online and you can actually, there's programs that will help generate barcode codes for your labels, okay? Some of them are, are even free. Um, for my books, I buy... Um, because I, I run my own publishing company. So for my books, I purchase, I have to purchase them. I purchase my barcodes 10 at a time. Okay, so I buy them, that's considered bulk. And they're still not expensive. I don't even know what I pay. It's it's not a lot, really. It's not a lot. Maybe a couple hundred bucks. Um, the only thing is, you, you know, you want to buy 10, you want to use them. So that's the whole key. But do you know that back in the days when I did the style and free stuff, okay, this was so crazy. There was an actual UPC company. I, I still have that package. That package is about the size of a phone book. You open it, tons of freaking information. Like, why do they even get... I, I still don't understand. I've never read it. I, I looked at that thing. I, I kind of leafed through it. I was like, what the hell is this, right? So what they did is they gave me a number. The number I had to send to... I guess it was the UPC. I remember it was in Manhattan. And I remember it was a brownstone. This is so crazy. Let me drink some water. It was a brownstone. And and it was downstairs. And when I went downstairs, they had like a business down there. And I, I mean, we're talking about a long time ago. This is 19, what, 90, 1996. Um, and I had to go down there. And I think I had to mail. No, I had to send them the number and then I had to go and pick up my barcode they couldn't email it to me they couldn't fax it to me I had to pick it up you know why it was an actual piece of film like film from a camera and when you held it up to the light you see the barcode it was crazy and I remember I might even still have that and it came like paper clipped to an to a piece of paper and then it was in an envelope. And that's what I had to bring to the manufacturer so they can shoot. Because they would actually take a picture of the barcode. It was weird how they did. They took a picture of, of the barcode and then they transferred it onto, um, onto the, the, the label. The, what do you call it? The insert. So uh, nowadays you don't have to do that. <laughs> Anybody who has barcodes on their stuff knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, but... But yeah, so you know, so I've been, you know, I I have I've had my hands in so many of those areas. I mean, to the point where you know I used to drive to the manufacturer, pick up my own CDs. I used to walk around to stores and try to get them placed on consignment. Uh, for those who don't know, everybody should know what consignment is. But what well, basically you put it on the shelf, you work out a deal, 50-50 split. If they sold it then they'll pay you the other half. But it's up to you to go to the store, check to see if it's still on the shelf. If it is, they'll collect. And if not, you have a choice. You can leave it there or you can take it out, <laughs> you know? So a lot of those CDs that I went around, I put them in the stores and I left them. I just I forgot about them. I, I It's weird because it wasn't, that's what, I wasn't into, I wasn't too interested in going and, and pick up the $5 or whatever it was I was picking up. I was more interested in seeing my product on their shelf. So, and not all stores did it. The the big stores definitely not. We couldn't do it. Uh, but the smaller mom and pop stores, yeah, they took it with no problem. Especially if it was if it was on on consignment. And also um, some of the the bodegas that used to sell CDs. Um, I mean, one of the first places to ever um, display my CD was a place called. Uh, Cubanitos. It was a it was a Cuban grocery store in Jackson Heights, and they took it was in on consignment, and they took a couple pieces, and they had that um that display that went on top of the counter, and you kind of spin you spin it around, you see the CD. So it's kind of cool because since it was local and a lot of my friends knew about it, they would go to the store, and you know everybody by habit you just spun that thing and looked, and there was my and my CD. I, I did a great job when it came to the coloring, so it really popped. So if any of you guys have the 
uh, Style of Free Alternative Dance Compilation, you know what I'm talking about. So it's pretty bright, you know. In fact, I got some of those copies here. Anybody who's interested, let me know. <laughs> Send me a message. I have about maybe six cases left. I have about, I think, nine. No, I have more. I had 12 because I think I got real something like four of them. So uh, they're very expensive. If you um, if you go online, if you go to Amazon or Google, I think those CDs are going for like $45 each. So I have cases uh, that have 25 in a case. So if you're interested in picking up a case, give me a call. I'll work you out one hell of a deal. Anyway, so, but basically that's what I, you know, what I'm trying to get to is that, you know, I've had my hands in quite a few things. So um, you can ask me questions and there's a lot of stuff, a lot of information that you know, I can share, that I know I can share and I'll be willing to share with you guys. So um, another thing I want to talk about, um, see what you guys think about this. A lot of us, I think I brought this up before, but this comes, it, it, it kind of, I think about it quite often, okay? I'm 53 years old right now. And it's weird, okay? I'm a, technically, everybody know in the industry knows me as a booking agent. Then they also know me as a manager for Little Susie and the Cover Girls. But mostly, mostly in the industry, they know me as a booking agent. And let me tell you something. I never in my life wanted to be a booking agent. I had no idea what the hell that was. So what I'm trying to get to here is that wasn't the dream I had. That wasn't what I wanted to do. So I did it for X amount of years. I don't know, 30, 30 years, maybe 20 something years. Definitely over 25 years as a legitimate agent where I was, I've been getting paid. Now I'm at a crossroads to the point where with social media, my service isn't, even though I have a lot of loyal um, promoters still that call me and they book for me. And of course, uh, you have to book my girls. They're exclusive with me. So it has to come through me. So I'm still able to maintain um, and the fact that, you know, my acts are pretty pricey, it actually evens out. I'm actually doing less acts for more money. Before I was doing a ton of acts for less money. So it, I'm not really seeing that hard of a hit at the pocket. A little hit. But there's definitely a little transition going on here. And it, the same thing with, I think that's just the middleman situation. It's almost like a uh, travel agent. Anybody who travels, you tell me when was the last time you used a travel agent. I think the only time you'll really use a travel agent, you probably won't even do that anymore, is if you're going to book, like, uh, an entire package. If you're going to go wherever, you're going to Italy, and you want the flights and the car and the, and the, and the hotels and the, whatever the case may be. So you might go through it. Or if you're doing the Fiji Islands and you're going to a resort, whatever the case, you might. But even then, there's probably like 90% of you guys that still would, would do that yourself because the internet has made that so, so easy. So a lot of these people who spend like their whole life as travel agents are basically out of a job. I would love to talk to someone who did this their entire life just to get an idea of what the hell are you doing now? <laughs> you know, it's crazy and it's scary because if you're my age, and, you know, or maybe you're a little older and you were a travel agent and all of a sudden that rug was pulled out from under you. Now what? What do you do? How do you transition that? Like, what else can you do? Maybe you could be a travel guide. Like, I mean, really, but how practical is that? You know, I mean, you're going from a travel agent to a travel guide. Just because you're a travel agent doesn't mean that you're an expert, that you can be a guide, <laughs> you know? So what kind of transition? What did they do? You know, what's going on with those people? So that's a middleman. Same thing with real estate agents. Uh, I, I don't even think real estate agents, the way they were before, I don't think they're as popular as they used to be. Uh, again, people are buying homes online for sale by owner they go in direct uh you go to places like um uh what is it uh trillo zillow zillow so you go like to zillow you can find the properties 
you know so there's there's a lot of things that you can uh if you're selling a home uh you know you, it, it, it that whole agency thing man is like almost out the window like who else uses agents you know i mean really who else is using agents i mean so that whole middle thing is like almost obsolete so now here i am 53 years old the agency thing is not promising meaning i can sustain it which i will sustain it but to try to think of it to as something to grow especially at our level now if you're a william morris working in Hollywood and you're dealing with actors now I could see that sustaining I could see that sustaining you're dealing with much bigger budgets and you're dealing with longer contracts so some of these contracts are you know take a year two years you know to fulfill before a film is released so and there's a lot of little you know little add-ons to that so I can understand that. And they're dealing with millions of dollars. You know, I'm, I'm going to be in a movie. It's 20 million. You know, so I can see that happening. Or any of the A-list mega artists that you know, I can see them still using agents because they need all, they need more help. There's a lot more money involved, and when there's a lot more money involved, there's a lot more risk, and things have to be done right. Because the last thing any of these artists want to do is get sued. When we start coming down to a low, especially with something freestyle, maybe even hip hop, um, that whole middle section could be totally uh, deleted. It doesn't. It's almost obsolete, you know. So now what? What do you What do you do? How do you sustain yourself? Now, I'm talking about with the music business, but what about some of you guys who your whole life have worked construction? Or you worked like my nephew plumbing, or you were an electrician. You did that your whole life. Trades, I don't know how many people, I don't know any people who dreamt of being having a trade. I'd, I'd never met anyone who dreamt of being a plumber or dreamt of being an electrician or a roofer or anything like that, you know. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've had people dream of being architects, of to be inventors and stuff like that, but not any of the trades, you know? So I think a lot of times when it came to these kind of jobs, people kind of accidentally fell into these situations for whatever reason. Oh, I needed a job. I started, I started out helping somebody. And next thing you know, I learned it. I kind of enjoyed it. The money was good. So I started doing it myself. So, where are you guys now in, in your lives? A lot of you guys are heading for retirement. Does anyone, is anyone contemplating or are hesitant about a career switch this late in the game? I'm just curious. Has anyone considered, if you were an electrician, have you considered doing something totally left field? I'm talking about Something that has nothing to do with electricity. I'm not talking about, um, I went from being a, uh, an electrician to a contractor. No, I, I'll say something like, uh, I went from being an electrician to a truck driver. Or an electrician to, <laughs> I don't know, uh, to a club owner. How's that? <laughs> you know, just transition uh, your careers, you know, maybe you're okay money wise, you're good, but you're not doing that job anymore. Now, what happens? Do you kind of go into your reserve and pull out these old memories, those old dreams that you had, and maybe try to pursue them? Or do you feel that maybe you're too old to pursue them? Here's what I'm trying to get How many people feel as though? They're getting too old to try to pursue something new. That they should, they feel that they've spent so many years doing a particular thing that it's stupid to change it now. That's like, okay, I spent 25 years operating as an agent. It's stupid to try to do anything else. 
If anything, I should just dive right back in it and try to see if there's a way I can expand it. Now, I have stuff that I'm doing like that. But what about some of you? Like, do you have that kind of, are you thinking about this at all? Are you, is this on your mind And how many of you are actually pursuing it? How many of you have actually late in the game totally went left field and say, yo, I'm doing this now out of the blue. I've I've met people like that. So it's crazy. I've had people, I've seen people, you know, all of a sudden start a business. You get this a lot. I think with a lot of people who retire like from the law enforcement or retire from like the fire department, a lot of times they have this extra money, this little residual, and they're still young. They're retiring pretty young. So they can, they go into other fields. Uh, Athletes, athletes, great example. So a lot of athletes, since they retire so young with so much money, all of a sudden they go into other fields. Look at what happened with, you know, Magic Johnson and uh, 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 Michael Jordan. Uh, I heard, I heard recently Kobe had a bunch of businesses that he was operating. So um, it goes on a lot, you know. Look at Mike Tyson. If you look at Mike Tyson, he does a podcast, and he's open, he has one of what is it with a CB CBD, the CBD. Uh, what is he? A, he has a farm. Is it a farm or is it a factory? What what is it? Like I didn't really dive too deep. I heard about it, and apparently he's smoking weed all the time. So he's a boxer. He's a dude that was all about health, <laughs> you know. And now he he's he's. He dived into this whole other, and I hear that he's he's knocking it out the out the park, man. He's making a ton of money, <laughs> and so yeah, I like to hear shit like that because Mike is more or less my age. I think he's probably my age, um, so it's like wow, yo, talk about left field. He totally went. You went from a health, you know, you're a boxer, man. It's all about your temple, to now. Going into this thing where people say, okay, well, you know, it's it's weed. It's still, you can still be in. I understand. It's just a mental thing, okay? Now you're smoking, regardless of what you're smoking. But you're smoking now. So you went from this health where, you know, you want to breathe in the fresh air of anything to now you're smoking weed, you know, and you're, and you're packaging it. You're basically a legal drug dealer. So that's basically what it is. Hey, I have nothing against it. I wouldn't mind getting into that. I have a felony, uh, well, a few of them. I don't know if I can do it, if they'll allow me to do it, but it's an interesting transition. It's a very interesting transition. So um, I would really love to hear what you guys have to say. Um, uh, Maybe because I got a lot of shit in my mind too, you know? I have a bunch of ideas. I have a bunch of stuff that I'm actually dabbling it in now, you know? So uh, I don't think I'll ever leave the music business. I don't think I'll ever leave, leave it. You know, I just have a passion for it. And freestyle in particular, it's not about the money. It's, it's about the culture. It's about trying to, you know, kind of like create this platform for our community to come on board and, and to see if we can, can we, can we take it further? Can we, can we bring in some new talent, you know, like, so I'm going to be here for a minute. I'm not going anywhere. So, but when you guys get a chance, man, go into the comments, whether it's Facebook or YouTube and, you know. Let me know what your what your thoughts are. I'm really, really, I love I love to create a conversation about this. So, but anyway, that's about it for tonight. I appreciate it. Tomorrow's Friday, and that will be um, that will be episode 31. That's tomorrow. Now check this out. If you notice from day one, January, I went so day two. So it was easy for me to tell which episode I was in. All I had to do was look at my calendar. So I have like my little calendar on the computer, the little, my date. So right now it says 1.30, so I know today was the 30th, the 30th episode. Tomorrow's going to be the 31st. But then after that, that ends, because now we begin with February. And even though we're February 1st, I'm not going to be doing episode one anymore, and I'm not breaking this into seasons I continue. So February 1st, then it will then be episode 32. So, and then we're going to continue. At that point, I have to really keep track. So when I bring up the episode, if you guys hear me uh, hesitate a little bit. That's why <laughs> I'm so used to looking at the computer. So I'm going to create some sort of chart just so I can look up and always know. Well, I have a calendar right behind, beside me. That might be it. Maybe I just need to... Uh, but that won't work because I have all my dates. My I'll be all confused. Yeah, I got to find something separate so I know what episode I'm on. So, all right, guys. So, listen, thank you very much. 
be safe tonight. I will talk to you tomorrow. And until then, good night, Freestyle. Before I lay me down to sleep, I pray to hear a freestyle beat. For if I die before I wake, I hope to make it to the break.